Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome back to the world of Madame Morbid. This is a history channel. I talk about any number of historical topics, many of which have a darker aspect to them. If you like what you see, please subscribe to my channel and like the video. Today, we are going to be talking about Pearl White. I've done two episodes about her already, about her younger years, her childhood in Green Ridge, Missouri, her teenage years in Springfield, Missouri. And when we left off, she was getting on the train to travel to Kansas to join an acting troupe there. She waited until she was 18, so her father couldn't tell her no. And she headed to Galena, Kansas to join the Truesdale Stock Company. It didn't go well. She worked there for about eight weeks and then was fired. This was very disappointing. But from here, she would go into a series of joining new companies and them either folding or she usually it was that they folded she did try to get a job in Coffeeville from a man she had known in Springfield in the acting world his name was Fred Rella and I discovered that when she was in the Count of Monte Cristo formants where she had that horrible accident where a sword went in her mouth. They had a button on the end to protect the actors from getting cut. But when she closed her mouth, when that actor put it in her mouth, he pulled it out and it pulled a big hunk of flesh off the roof of her mouth. Mr. Rella was in charge of the Deemer Theater at that time. Dr. Deemer had sold it. Fred Rella was the manager. It was pretty exciting. I found a an advertisement for the Monte Cristo production. It told me who the actor was that accidentally injured Pearl, who was playing Monte Cristo. His name was Robert Grandy. He was an Italian actor. He moved on very soon after this 1906 period as well. That performance of Monte Cristo occurred in March of 1906, right before the lynching on the square. and. Evidently, Pearl would have still been in Springfield when that lynching occurred. But I don't know if those kind of events influenced people to start leaving Springfield. But something must have been going on at the Deemer so that everybody just kind of left. And Pearl was one of them too. Frederick Rella left. Robert Grandy left. And they all went to Kansas. Frederick Rella went to Coffeeville, Kansas and formed his own company. He was evidently very popular there. The Coffeeville newspaper talks about him in very positive tones. Pearl went there to try to get a job. Unfortunately, as soon as she arrived, he had fallen ill the day before and his illness evidently was extremely bad. I don't know what he had, but she says in her book, he had gotten sick the day before and was actually unconscious. The manager of the theater told her, we don't really need anybody right now. And so she traveled again to get a job somewhere else. She works there for several weeks. And while she's there, she meets a young man named Earl Metcalf, who is in the same troupe with her. And he also is going to become a huge movie star of the silent screen later on. But at this time, he's just like her. He's a young man. He's just starting his career. She comes back to Coffeeville when this opportunity also falls through after several weeks. She has sent out a series of letters asking for jobs. Coffeeville replies and says, yes, come immediately. So she comes and she performs there for several weeks in Mr. Rella's company, but unfortunately he would die. And the papers chronicle his fight against this illness for weeks. They held a benefit for him on Memorial Day. He must have put up a valiant fight. In early June, it says, I believe he fell ill in late May. And in in early June, it says he only has days to live. He lived a whole nother month after that and died in early July. Pearl went to his funeral and evidently it was very upsetting for her because she said his face haunted her for months. 
afterwards and she avoided going to funerals as much as possible. She only went to one or two in the next 10 years. He passed away in early July, 1907. He was 58 years old. He had been from Canada and he had performed with some really famous actors of his day. After her disappointment at being fired by the Truesdale Stock Company, Pearl decided that maybe she needed to change the way she looked. So she went and she got pictures of famous actresses and she tried to copy how they looked. She said she had never liked her hair. So she decided to dye it black. And she said, ladies, I have some advice. If you really wanna mess up dyeing your hair, do it yourself. She said she had black everywhere. She had black on her neck and on her face and she had dots of black all over where she had done it. But she said after a while she did get better at dyeing her own hair and she kept it black for about two years. She said she would pile it as high on top of her head as she could. She started to wear some makeup. She had never done that before. She, other than when she was on stage. She wore some powder. She liked to keep her skin really white. She had naturally red rosy cheeks and so she was trying to tamp that down, which sounded like a bad idea to me because most of us want color. But she lined her eyebrows, she wore really long skirts and she thought she looked like a perfect actress. But she was struggling to find who she was and how was she going to look and how was she going to succeed in this business that is so cutthroat. Truesdale actually took her back later. She made the comment that the woman they replaced me with must have been worse than me because they took me back. But she was just switching companies constantly. And when she was with one company, she said they barely brought in enough money to have room and board and get to the next place. It was such a struggle. And at one point, as they are all expecting to get paid, the manager steals all of their pay and takes off. She tells one story of a performance they did in Topeka, Kansas. This was with the Truesdale that had taken her back. She was playing a jockey. The play was called My Old Kentucky Home or something like that. It was actually curtain call. She said they always used a horse in whatever town they went to. This night, it was a horse that had never acted before. And during the curtain call, she's sitting on the horse's back and she said the lights were really bright and something scared the horse and it kicked as they were lowering the curtains and she flew into the audience. She said she landed in an old man's lap. She wasn't hurt, but it scared her really good and she was really embarrassed, obviously. There were about six steps that went back up to the stage and she said she went up on her hands and knees. She didn't even stand. And as she did this, her silk jockey pants split or maybe they were split already from the fall. And so since she was bending over and going up, kind of walking up on all fours, these stairs, all everybody could see was her, her rear end I'm guessing her underpants through these torn silk jockey pants. Another funny story she tells about being on the road involved a little town in Oklahoma about 20 miles outside of Tulsa. She thought it might have been called Kiefer, Oklahoma. It was a mining town and all of the miners were there without their families. They had just gotten paid so they had gotten very drunk to go watch the performance. She said this particular night, even though they'd been doing comedies, they had run out of a comedy and so they did a melodrama. The villain in these stories was always called the heavy. And she said the villain in this story was especially bad. There was a scene where he throws a woman across the stage, stands over her while she's on the ground with his fists clenched and starts calling her names and threatening her. The men in the audience had decided that this actor must also be like that in real life. And when this scene started, someone stood up and started cursing at him and threatening him and saying, if you wanna beat up on somebody, why don't you do it on somebody your own size? And then that man volunteered to be the one to fight with him. 
the villain ran off the stage and disappeared for the rest of the performance. And the women were trying to talk the audience down. And Pearl says she went on stage and told them, look, we don't like this guy either. So why don't you let us finish the play? And then when it's all over, you can use the theater to have your big fight. If you'll just sit down now and let us finish. So they agreed to do that. Meanwhile, backstage, they are making arrangements to try to get him out of town without him getting hurt. They put him in a, a wicker hamper that was about four feet long. He's a six foot guy, but they fold him up in there and she said she covered him with clothes. And then they put the lid on. And he's just sitting backstage in this hamper. They finish the play and they get to the scene where he is supposed to be walked out in handcuffs. And of course he doesn't show up. And so the mob is so angry and want to know where he is. And, and they say, well, we think we saw him run toward the hotel. A good portion of the crowd run toward the hotel to go find him. And some of the others stay behind to help them pack. And she said they actually helped them move that hamper onto the train and he got away safely. Pearl met Victor Sutherland. He was another member of the company. And on October 12th, 1907, while on tour in Oklahoma City, they got married in front of all of their fellow actors on stage at the People's Theater. She doesn't mention Victor at all in her book. They were married for seven years. One newspaper article said they got married on a dare, that he dared her to marry him and she took the dare. Seven years later in 1914, she demands a divorce. The newspaper article about it claims that it was because he had been unfaithful on one specific evening that she caught him meeting another woman. But in 1914, she was just beginning Perils of Pauline. She was getting famous. His movie career began around then as well. He made his first movie. He was never a movie star like Pearl was, but he had a really long 50 year career. He was on a lot of television shows including shows like Perry Mason. He did movies, including some Westerns. He had a very prolific character actor career. He would die at 79 years old in 1968. He very much outlived Pearl, who was dead by 49. She joined a troupe run by Al Beasley and his wife, Sarah. They were in Scranton, Mississippi. The theater was an open air theater and it was really near the beach and near the ocean. And their rooming house was also near the ocean. She said after their night performance, a huge storm came up and they sat on their porch and they watched it battering the shoreline. But unfortunately, the next morning, they found out that the theater had flooded and they lost a huge part of their wardrobe and other things they needed to perform. And this hurt them very badly because they were already struggling a little bit. They had lost some players. They were down to seven people, but they did manage to keep going. In Anniston, Alabama, they came upon a fire sale which meant a store had burned and they were selling what had survived or what might have been slightly damaged for really good prices. And she said they were able, luckily, unfortunate for the store that suffered this, but it helped them build back their wardrobe and their costumes. Another little town in Alabama, they had a really good turnout. She's, they were doing what's called wildcatting, which meant they just tried to book shows as they were traveling. If you come into a town, you would say, would you guys like to see a play? And they would do it that way. She wasn't sure what the name of the town was, but they were going to perform in the schoolhouse, like a one room schoolhouse kind of thing. She said you couldn't tell that anybody even lived there. Whether There were just a few stores. You would see a house here and there. But they went in and they rang the bell on the school. And she said, shortly thereafter, people just started flooding in from all over. 
where they lived in these rural areas. And she said they had a lot of success in that town. That little town was the last successful place they played on this particular trip. She said they they stumbled along for a few more weeks, but eventually they came to a theater that they started playing, but eventually the guy decided he'd rather show moving pictures than a stock company. She doesn't really point a lot to this, but this is showing how the acting profession is changing. It's going to move from these professional stage actors to movies that can be brought to people without these traveling troops. There's a woman in their company named Helen Hamilton. She had performed in New York and she'd been there many times. And she told Pearl, she said, you need to go to New York City. It's the beginning of the season, it was September. Go there, see if you can get some roles because this traveling life is just not sustainable. And so that's exactly what Pearl did. And she headed to New York City armed with a list of different companies and names of managers and people that she could contact to try to get a job. Thank you so much for joining me today. Next time we will continue the story of Pearl White as she arrives in New York and reaches movie stardom. I'll see you next time.